Hello and welcome to uh, this session. Uh, my name is Abdi, I'm the uh, Hornbill Sales Manager um, and we're going to take you through a quick overview of the Hornbill Collaboration Platform and one of the, or a couple of the Hornbill apps, uh, one of which is the Hornbill Service Manager app and the Hornbill Document Manager app. So, to get started, let's have a, a quick look at the Hornbill platform. Uh, and this is, if you like, the underlying technology that drives the, the collaborative core or the collaborative platform. Um, and uh, the key principle here is that this is accessible anywhere. So it's a SaaS-based deliverable. You can get to it anywhere, anytime, uh, and pretty much from any device, as long as you've got access back to the World Wide Web or the Internet. Um, key to the um, delivery here is the, the ability that you can, as I say, get to it anywhere. Um, so mobility is important um, and through the native iPhone app you are always connected um, to the service and have all your notifications directly in your hand. One of the key challenges we've tried to address uh, is the concept of language. You know, With um, companies working more globally today, we've got customers, colleagues um, all over the place and uh, typically speaking their own native tongues. Um, one of the things we've tried to do is, is to address that challenge by building in some fairly powerful language capabilities and during today's demonstration we'll give you a view of that. Key to our delivery is the concept of continuous deployment and basically what this means is you're always up to date with the latest features and functions available from Hornbill. So as and when uh, a new feature is tested and ready to go into production it's deployed automatically into your system seamlessly uh, without any uh, work from your part or um, in, fact, in fact probably without you even noticing to be honest um, and that appears and is available to you straight away. One of the key challenges there is that one of the platform capabilities is that you're able to customize the Hornbill solution um, by adding fields or changing the forms, adding buttons and various other things which we'll explore today as well. Um, and one of the key uh, criteria here is that any customizations that you've made are always up, um, upgradable if you like and uh, as a result you don't lose any of the effort or time that you've invested in customizing the solution uh, for your own purposes. The other thing we're going to look at today is, say, is a couple of the Hornbill apps. Um, apps are available through the platform app store and we'll have a look at that as well. Um, so as I say, the apps give you line of business uh, tools and in, in today's demonstration we'll be talking about Hornbill Service Manager which is our service desk tool uh, and Hornbill Document Manager which again is our uh, document management tool. Hornbill Collaboration Core is built upon the platform and that basically is as a uh, a tool that you can use across your business to uh, drive communication, um, foster ideas and, and basically make everyone aware of what's going on effectively. So it's bringing conversations out of email, putting it into a news feed or a workspace uh, and allowing people to collaborate, contribute uh, and comment if you like on, on their thoughts and feelings about uh, something that's up for discussion. And a workspace, as we'll see today's demo, is, is anything really. It could be discussion around a particular project. Uh, you may have a project going on right now to look at a new service desk, so you could have created a workspace around that and all of your comments and thoughts around the different tools and solutions that you're looking at uh, could be placed in there for all the team to look at and review. Um, it's a roles and rights based platform and solution, so realistically any um, user of the system gets access to what entitlement they have based on the role and right that they have. Uh, and nothing more. Activity streams are a key uh, tenant of the of the platform. So activities, in humble terms, means uh, anything that's generated either manually, i.e., tasks that you assign to yourself. Um, so it could be that you set yourself a, a task to do uh, your expenses, for example, or it could be a task that's generated for you by somebody else, or indeed the business process engine that underpins some of the uh, business apps that we've mentioned mm -hmm. previously. So in the case of Service Manager app, that might be an authorization for a change or a new starter or any of those sorts of things that may come off the back of a process or a workflow um, that's within your service management uh, domain. So that's activity streams. Location awareness is one of the other key ideas that we have within the, the Hornbook Collaboration course. So this is just the ability to see or know who uh, or, what, or what colleagues are nearby. Um, and again, this is driven off the uh, mobility uh, side of things in terms of the, 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 the app, knowing exactly where you are from a, from a location perspective and being able to share that information should you wish uh, back with your colleagues. 
Built into the both the mobile app and the platform was the concept of conversations or chat. So again, I can start a, a single uh, conversation with one colleague, or I could start a one-to-many conversation as well, and that can be uh, started on the Windows cl- uh, on the web uh, web client or uh, picked up later on during the, using the mobile as well. My library uh, is based around the the document manager app, which we mentioned briefly earlier, and that really is a is actually a free app that's available. Uh, under the Hornbill App Store, it's a productivity app. Um, some of the apps are chargeable, some of them are free. Uh, but my library is part of the Document Manager application, which basically allows you to upload, store, manage, and collaborate on your documents, uh, either personally or with your colleagues or across the whole organisation. So again, we'll have a look at that today. So that's the collaboration side of things. And then, as I say, today's uh, demo, which Steve, my colleague, is going to run you through, is based around the Hornbill Service Manager app today as well Um, and this is building on our 20 years experience as a service management um, provider or tools vendor if you like Um, so we've tried to bring into play all of the experience that we've gained over those 20 years to build on best practice and build on our pedigree in this in this space to leverage uh, a tool that's intuitive easy to use uh, but still powerful and capable Um, so, you know, building on that comment about intuitive and easy to use, hopefully uh, through today's demo you will see that in action. Um, we've tried to maintain a very clean and simple interface, uh, which is um, effective um, and easy to pick up, um, whilst underpinning that with, as it says up there, the business process automation, which you'd expect from a service management tool. So, underpinning all of the um, all of the forms and all of the workflows within the service manager app is the ability for you to come in and orchestrate your business process around, in this case, service management or uh, whatever it may be, um, to drive uh, behavior and, and activity within your organization. Progressive capture is a, a new look at how we get information into the system. Um, traditionally, uh, especially in the service management space, uh, an application would be uh, presenting you with a, a form which has you know several um, dozen fields, many of which are unused in most instances and they're only just to cater for the exception if you like. So one of the challenges we've tried to address for customers is the idea that um, uh, a training overhead is reduced by the fact that we can actually drive through intelligent presentation of forms um, uh, the, the, the necessary information and only the necessary information capture at a particular point within any particular process. So again, we'll have a look at that, the dynamic forms effectively uh, for capturing information. Dashboards kind of goes without say, obviously information in, information out. So the idea here is to present the right information to the right people. So dashboards, real time uh, and other MI information which we'll tr- touch on again today. Lastly, before we hand over to Steve, my colleague, uh, we have the head-up display, and this is really building on the concept of intuitive, easy to use, uh, visibility, uh, but also bringing into sort of view what the underlying process is. So given that uh, an analyst is working particularly on a ticket, maybe a change request, they may not understand the end-to-end underlying process, but this display is designed to give them a visibility of exactly where they are, what's happened already up until this point and what's likely to happen next. So they have good visibility of what that ticket uh, life cycle is uh, based on the underlying business process. So as I say, there's a, a quick a quick overview of what we're going to talk you through today. So we'll start with a, sort of a demo in two parts. Um, Steve will take you through initially looking at some of the collaborative features of uh, the Hornbill application. Um, and then we'll come in and have a look at the service manager specifically in terms of service management capabilities Uh, and along the way you'll see uh, a lot of the the tenants that we've talked about here in terms of the mobility, the language, um, some of the other aspects around conversations, workspaces, activities, uh, dashboards, so all of that hopefully we'll tease out through the session. Thanks again for joining us today and I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Steve to give you a quick preview of the Hornbill solution. Thanks, Abdi. So, uh, picking up on what Abdi was saying, uh, we're going to have a look initially at the collaboration core. Uh, and in, to, in order to do that, we're going to log in as a collaboration user. So, we'll just log in to Hornbill now. Uh, we're coming in as uh, a, a user, Anna. Um, we can see Anna is logged in the top right hand corner. Um, Anna's logged in using her 
her local language. If she spoke to different languages, she could change the UI to the language of her choice. You can see that she's got notifications uh, pending. Uh, these could be relating to updates to workspaces she's a member of or updates to tickets she's following um, or uh, conversations that she's participating in. All of those updates are uh, available to her. Coming across the screen here, and we can see in the middle here, we've got the, the news feed view. This is really that um, aggregated, um, sort of chronologically ordered updates from all of the different areas that Anna's interested in. So when a workspace is being updated or a ticket that she has logged has been updated, all of those updates will appear chronologically in this news feed. Um, obviously the most relevant at the top, almost up to date at the top for me. On the right hand side, I will see the options I've got as the, as the platform user on here. So initially I've got the options to to create and upload my, my profile information. So let's just drop in and have a look at that. So what we can do here is, is invite our, our users to actually publish and make information about themselves um, available. So it could be you know, their job title, um, the department they work in, contact information, or it could also be interests or qualifications and, um, and training areas. Safe in the knowledge that they can actually set their own privacy levels around who has the rights to view this information in terms of other platform users. Uh, and we can do this, obviously, um, Anna's doing that in her, in her local language, but um, if we have users using the, uh, the interface in a different language, let me, just, uh, let me switch this uh, to Chinese, we can have a look at actually how a, a different user would, um, would experience using the platform here. So really it's a case of saying, OK, all the, the, the uh, menu options, all the labels, etc., uh, will be available in their local language when they're, when they're logged in. Okay. My Chinese isn't great, so I'm going to come back out and have a look at English. One of the reasons for uh, inviting and, and, and asking our platform users to provide that level of information is that once we've got that information in there, this, uh, this enables us to have a pretty ma a mature and useful uh, corporate directory. So all of our co-workers and colleagues are in here. Uh, we can see them, we can start new conversations, we can email them directly from here. We can see who's actually on site or uh, around with the location awareness. Um, and it just allows us to, as an initial sort of search point, to find a colleague and engage with them. Conversations um, allow us to have sort of one-to-one -one or maybe even one-to-many conversations, sort of instant messenger capabilities on here. So I could be asking Alan uh, questions regarding timesheet. I could come in and add additional participants, and I could do that either through the web client um, and or the, uh, the mobile interface, which we'll have a little uh, look at as we go forward. Other options, though, if we come back up to the news feed, is, is looking in the context of uh, workspaces. Workspaces are really sort of um, areas where people can come to together to collaborate on a subject matter, and that subject matter could be, um, you know, could be anything. It could be, if we look in these examples, it could be um, a finance project looking at upgrading their their applications, and so the members of that workspace would be just potentially those in the finance department, and that workspace could be open or closed depending on on, on obviously how private it was. Could be other things such as you know, products and ideas, or it could be um, a workspace where uh, for people that share the same corporate tools, you know, iPhones being an example. So if we drop in and have a look at that iPhone workspace here, we can see maybe these are all the members within the organisation that have uh, iPhones, um, and logically would have a reason to be a, a membership of this workspace. The workspace then again just allows the members to come in here and, and post. Um, and ask questions um, and that sort of leads on to actually those workspaces being used not just by the, uh, the platform users but maybe by you know a support function so IT could actually be a member of this workspace and they could come in here and they could publish out policy relating to the iPhone so you know if Apple release a new iOS uh, update uh, IT might come in here and say actually you know what guys you know although it's available please hang off actually uh, taking that update whilst we do our own internal testing before we apply that you know things like that Equally though, a member of that workspace could come in, could be uh, struggling with some functionality on the iPhone, um, and they might want to come in and ask a question. So they might want to come in uh, and ask a question. So in this example, Anna has um, come in and asked a question because she's struggling to reset her iCloud password. Uh, and we can see here that uh, other users that would have been notified that there was an update to their workspace can come in and if they so desire, they can provide uh, potential answers to that issue. And we can see there's been answers provided by three colleagues, one of which is our colleague Dun that's working in Chinese. So this really demonstrates our, our dynamic translation capabilities where Dun can post or answer this in his local language. I can come in working English using the translate capability and view that answer uh, in my native language for me. 
What you can also see here, though, is once those answers have been provided, other members can come in and actually validate those. And actually say, yeah, that was the right answer that worked for me. And those are the most, uh, most votes can uh, sort of rise to the top. Equally, though, the person that posted the question in the first place can come in, look at the answers that have been provided, and say, Do you know what, of those answers, this was one that worked for me, and we can validate that with the, with the poster's choice. The reason for sort of posting and providing the, this question answer um, functionality is so that when other users of the platform come in and they're looking for you know, maybe iOS related content, they can come and just use the search bar at the top. So, okay, well, what information is already uh, on the platform has already been provided by my, uh, my co workers? Or it could be actually someone had exactly the same issue. You know, I want a, some help around resetting my iCloud password. They could come in and search for that. They could see that the question's already been posted. They can see that answers have been provided and validated by their. Uh, by their, uh, their colleagues. Other options that are available to us as well as a platform user is the ability to use the, the My Library uh, function. So this allows me to um, upload, um, share um, and revise documents and then eventually publish that out to libraries for other users to, to consume. So if we look in this example here I've got a couple of uh, documents that uh, uh, that I have uh, own or I've, uh, I've created, as well as access to any other libraries that are on the platform as well. So within this particular example here, um, I've loaded up this technical requirements doc. Um, I've decided to share that with uh, an individual. Um, I've then also maybe potentially revised that with that colleague, a number of revisions, so we can keep the revision history um, accessible here. Uh, once we're happy that that's in a, a state that's ready to be published to the wider community, I can then move that into an active state and decide to actually publish that out to a uh, a library or multiple libraries and we can see here that I published that out to the co-works directory. I've got the option to lock that document so no one else can edit it once it's published or when it's in when it's being revised and I can also attribute it uh, tags so that we can assist the users looking for for content when they're um, uh, when they're using the platform. So we've come in the same way as we were looking for content in our work content in our workspaces and I might search for all presentation related uh, content and again it's going to drop me down um, into those uh, documents and I might then come in have a look at that document but as I'm now just um, reviewing it my options are really limited to just sort of downloading and collaborating on it rather than having the options to share or upload a revision unless I've had this document shared with me directly those those options um, aren't available to me. Finally a couple of other just sort of touch points on here I wanted to comment on we're looking at today in the context of, of service management as well so if we've got the service manager app installed which we'll look at in a second um, a, a, a user of the platform has access to self-service in, in terms of them being able to raise a new request, update existing ones, those functionality are there. Finally though we have the concept of activities which Abdi also mentioned and again these can either be human based or sort of process based so in this example you know I could create uh, activities for me to uh, remind me to submit my expenses on a monthly basis or arrange one-to-ones with my, uh, my line manager. I might create activities for my colleagues and I might define a number of checklist items against each of those activities that I'm creating uh, for them to complete. Uh, alternatively though, um, if we're running a, a line of business application such as Service Manager where there's a, a business process running, that business process could actually automatically be sending out activities um, to, the, uh, to the platform users. So that could be tasks to do things or it could be authorization decisions to make. So we can see here that Anna is actually perhaps involved in a cab um, on here and she's been allocated out an authorization decision and she can come in either through the the web or the or the mobile client uh, and make that decision and, and progress this forward all of the options in terms of the uh, outcomes as we're here are fully definable for, for each uh, task or, or, uh, or approval that you uh, create okay so we've had a look at this from the, the, the web perspective I just want to sort of drop in briefly and have a look at it from the, the mobile client as well so every two seconds I'll just bring that up on screen for you Perfect. Okay, so if we're having a look here, we've got a native iPhone app, and we can see here that we've got notifications uh, against the app uh, when I go in. But we'll, we'll go in there and we're, we're logging as a different user here. But really, it's just to demonstrate that the same features and functions that we're looking at in the web client are available to me uh, in the mobile client as well. So I've got access to my, uh, my newsfeed, so I'm always informed and up to date with what's happening. You know, questions that are being asked, uh, asked by my colleagues are available to, me here, available to me here. I can drop in, again, look at the questions, look at the answers. That have been provided, use the translate capability to see obviously what the colleagues are providing and if they're posting in different languages. My notifications at the top, I can check in. I've got the same sort of menu options on the left hand side, so I can access my conversations and update them from here. 
I've got my access to my co-workers directory, external contacts, uh, organisations. Uh, we've also got the ability here to use the location awareness to actually have a look at if there's any colleagues uh, nearby within a certain um, um, definable per, uh, distance parameter. But I've also got access as well to my workspaces and activities on my mobile as well. So in this example, I'm logged into different users that's got lots of activities assigned to them, one of which might be related to a, a change request. So it might be my, my job to review this change. So one of the things I might want to do is actually have a look at the, uh, uh, the change that this relates to. So I can bring up the change details here, have a look at the change information, then come back up to the activity um, and then define from the available outcomes um, how I want to progress this and give some justification for the, uh, the, the, uh, the activity that I'm completing. Coming back though and having a look at the, the other menu options, as I mentioned, uh, we've got access to workspaces and activities. But when we move on and have a look at the Service Manager app in a second, you'll notice that as a user of that Service Manager app, I've actually got access to my, my tickets and my request list from here, so I'm logged in as a, an analyst, I've got access to my, my instance service requests, etc. Uh, and from those from those tickets I can drop in and I can I can reassign, resolve, etc., update those tickets. All of those options are available to me. Great, okay, we'll just come out of that. Perfect. Okay, so we've had a look in the, in the context of Anna, but we'll we'll log out as Anna and come back in as a, a different user that's got rights to use the service management application. So just while we're, we're logging in as that user, I'm just going to come across to our, our admin console because I just want to sort of touch on our, our app store. So Abdi mentioned this right back at the beginning. Once we've got that collaboration core installed, you can come into the app store and actually uh, install or deploy out your, your line of business applications, whether it be service management, customer management, document management, or a variety of others that are coming shortly. But once those apps are installed and, and we've given the users the appropriate rights and permissions to use those apps, we can come into those applications and this is where we can start to build um, our underlying logic and business processes that are, that are going to support what we want to do with inside each of those different applications. But if we take Service Manager as an example here and we have a look at the business processes, we might have different processes that, that support different types of instance that we're logging or maybe a, a single change process. But if we have a look at these, they're simply just stages with decision points and, and nodes. There could be multiple stages within single processes. They can be simple or complicated. Um, but in terms of building these, it's a case of you know dragging and dropping and, and just completing the nodes. There's no sort of coding or, um, or need for any specialist skills to, to work with these. But if we come back up and have a look at maybe a slightly more simplistic one, maybe you've got a process for managing your desktop instance that are being logged. We can see here that it's got three stages. Uh, and within the first stage here, we might come in and define whether we're going to be sending email confirmations to the customer when to, uh, instance are logged against our desktop service. If that's the case, what template's being used? All of that is definable by yourself. You can also use the business processes to control whether um, SLAs are used at all for these types of uh, these types of tickets. And if they are, are you interested in using um, response and fix targets? And if you are using them, when do they start and what constitutes them being achieved? You can use the business process to manage routing. And again, it's simply a case of coming in and deciding where you want that to be attributed to, as well as it controlling activities uh, and various other functions, which we'll have a look at shortly. Last thing I just wanted to comment on before we uh, go back in here is, as well as having business processes which take care of how we fulfill against those different types of requests that we're, we're working with, we also have the concept of progressive capture. And we'll look at this very shortly, but in, in essence, really, it's the experience that either the analyst or the end user will have when they're actually logging a request into the system, whether it's through self-service or the, the, the web client. So on here, it basically um, will provide them with a forms-based uh, view, and those, uh, the view will be uh, in context of the information that they're required to enter at a particular point. It's not going to show them a, a page full of hundreds and hundreds of fields, and they have to work their way through it. What this will do is allow you to control which of those subforms appear and what order they appear in, uh, whether they branch depending on the input or answer given to a previous question. Well, again, all this is built graphically um, for you, but we'll take a look at that in practice. Okay, so coming back out and coming into the, the UI, we're now logged in as a different user. We're logged in as Daniel. Uh, Daniel has the same access to the underlying collaboration features that Anna had, um, as we looked at previously. But on the left-hand side here, we can see a number of extra icons that have been uh, enabled uh, as a result of Daniel having access to different apps. So we've got um, the service manager app here. Uh, Daniel is also an administrator, so might have access to our um, asset management capabilities and also other apps, sort of a, a contact or customer manager app. But if we start with uh, service manager, we have a look in the context of the request list. So you know where where Daniel is going to spend most of his time. 
when we come into this view, uh, Daniel's seeing this view in the context of the rights and permissions that he's been attributed. So on here, Daniel's got the rights to work with instant service requests, problems and changes. If Daniel hadn't been given the rights to work with, with change requests, that icon would actually not appear. He wouldn't see it. So it wouldn't be a case of clicking on something and, and not having the rights to use it. But in here, I can just come and say, actually, I want to have a look at uh, my service requests. I want to look at all of my tickets. And I can do that in the context of the tickets that are directly assigned to me or assigned to a team uh, that I'm a member of. And on here, I can be a member of, uh, of multiple teams. So it could be that I just want to have a look at actually all of the instances that have been assigned to the first line team. Or well, I want to have a look at all of the changes that have sat with the change management team. Or if I'm being, you know, looking at an overall picture, I want to look at all request types across all teams that I'm a member of. So it's very easy and intuitive in terms of working between those views. And I can complement that further by using filters, in this case, quick filters. So I can just literally come in and type and say, okay, of all the tickets, for all the teams that I'm a member of, which ones of those are VPN related? And I can apply those filters quickly. I can also create my own predefined filters. So I can set up nice and sort of quick and easy ones, you know, sort of, uh, I want to look at all the, fire, the iPhone related requests that have been logged or show me all the, the tickets that have been resolved today. But you can also use it to, to build slightly more involved um, queries such as show me all the tickets that were logged last year and um, that are still open, still sat with the first line team but haven't been updated since January. Uh, and I can create those lists because I'm probably interested in, in as to why those are, are still active uh, and drill down and see what's happening. Coming across though further, I can also configure uh, which columns are, are displayed and the order they're displayed um, on here by simply coming in and dragging and dropping the fields that, uh, that I want to be displayed. So it could be that I want to bring uh, the status field in here as well. I can also uh, decide which of these columns will be displayed if I'm using or viewing this web client on a smaller, uh, smaller res screen or, or a tablet. And these are denoted with the, uh, the, the screen image. So we'll apply that change in here. And we can now see the, the information that's available to us. I'm just going to move forward now and raise a, a new request into um, Hornbill. And again, based on my rights and permissions, I'll only have the options to, to raise what I'm uh, entitled to raise. So here I can raise request problems and changes. At this stage, we, we work in the concept of having a, a request because until we've ascertained who the caller is and what they're calling about, we don't necessarily know whether it's a, uh, an instant or a, a service request. So the first thing we'll do using the <coughs> progressive capture form is identify the caller. So on this occasion, we'll use myself. We can verify that it's the right caller and any feedback that's been previously, uh, previously given. And once we're happy that it's um, Steve, we can move forward and maybe record what Steve's calling about. So it could be a, a word printing issue. Can't print docs, for example. The key thing here is that <clears throat> only the relevant um, parts of the form are presented at the appropriate time. Once we've completed a section, it's verified and is automatically collapsed. So here we know it's Steve, he's calling about a word printing issue. That sounds very much like it's a desktop support issue, just to verify what that service offers. We can validate that and move on to the next stage. We perhaps know enough at this point as well to know whether it's um, an, uh, sort of a break fit instant or a, a service request we know we need to fulfill against something. So we can make that, uh, make that decision. It's an instant, you know, we might ask our analyst to specify the priority. Again, it's entirely up to you using that progressive capture, whether these questions are asked, the order they're asked, um, and if there's any sort of branching based on the outcomes that have been defined. Well, we'll specify that as medium, and maybe what we want to associate one or, or multiple assets of the customer at the point that we're logging. But at that point, hopefully we're happy um, and we can log that into the system. So at this stage, an underlying business process will be invoked, um, and that's going to take care of notifications that are going to have been sent automatically, routing rules, etc. So we'll drill in and we'll view that particular request. So we can see here that the ticket's been logged. Um, the underlying business process is graphically represented by a head-up display, and that displays the stages for this particular process. And it also displays the checkpoints, both checkpoints that have been achieved and those that are, are outstanding. So we can see here that the email's been sent and it's been assigned to the particular team, but at the moment, no one within that team has actually taken ownership of it. So the first thing I want, might want to do is come in and say, okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna own that. And I'm, gonna, I'm gonna assign that to myself. <clears throat> what we'll notice happen then is that the checkpoint has been achieved. We move on to the next stage in this example process. And in this example process, we actually now need to look at resolving that issue. So automatically, a, an activity has been assigned for me to go and investigate that particular, uh, that particular issue. So if I now go on and I can say, okay, well, it looked like it was a nice, nice simple one, um, just a, a paper jam, and we can clear that out. So paper jam. 
cleared, we can apply that. Again, we've defined all outcomes that are on here. So in this example, a number of things have now happened. The, the call's been moved into a resolved status, the SLA time has stopped, the process has been completed, and we may have actually sent them in the, the customer an email asking for some feedback on the request that we've just, uh, just completed. So that's great in terms of having some sort of automation that sits behind the tickets, but there's probably also a number of manual things that we um, that we would need or would like to do within this request. So um, if we have a look at the uh, control bar across the middle here, we can see a number of options that are available to us. One of which is we can just simply come in um, and append that with, with comments. So um, yeah, we can update this here, and we could choose whether this update was being visible to the customer on self-service or just retained within the team, and we can apply that update. All the updates then drop into the timeline, which is your audit trail of everything that's happened against the request when it happened. Um, but as well as comments, you know, you might have customers uploading screenshots of errors or someone else in the team saying, I've seen this before, and this is, the, this is a screenshot of it or an error message. So we can come in, cut and paste, drop that in, and again, decide whether we want to share that or not uh, with the team. In, as well as <coughs> just putting in comments and text, we might also want to share or embed uh, video content that might uh, help with the resolution, and we can push that out to, to self service for the users to, to view. Um, and we can do that by just going off and searching, you know, you know, YouTube or what have you. Or we can actually demonstrate our, our custom buttons here. So I can come in and create a custom button that's going to launch uh, YouTube and pass through the uh, the details in the summary description line to actually populate and do the search in, in YouTube automatically for us. So we see here there might be a number of uh, documents that might or videos that might help us in terms of um, printing issues. And it's not so much interesting in actually watching it in this, at this particular point, but what I might want to do is pick up on the uh, path and I might want to share that. So we'll come back to Hornbill, drop that in, and again we can share that, decide whether that's being shared just within the context of the team or out to the customer as well, and obviously they can watch that in line uh, via self service. Other options that are available to us, so as well as having um, automated activities. We can also record um, you know, details of conversations that we're having or schedule callbacks or create other types of activities. That's all definable for us. We can uh, search for and associate one or you know, multiple files and we can do that by searching for those files or if we minimize this down we might simply just want to drag and drop files in and once we've um, linked those to the request we can upload them and on doing so, if there hadn't been any previously, then a new attachment area is going to appear dynamically now that it's relevant, and that atta attachment will also be recorded in the, the timeline for us as well. Other options include you know, linking and searching for other requests of similar type. So I might look for other incidents that are word-related and do a search for that, and it's going to return me lots of word-related issues, and I can link them individually or link them as a, as a group. I might want to uh, email directly out, so using a, a predefined template, I can come in and uh, communicate whoever I need to. I can, you know, BCC and CC whoever I need. Maybe pick up on attachments that have been linked to this request, or sort of go off and do a more uh, global search on my desktop. I can change the customer. I can reassign. We can escalate or de-escalate based on, on how that's come in. Assign assets and eventually resolve. We've also got the options, as you'd expect, to be able to promote um, or create a new change or, or problem off the back of that. So all the standard sort of um, you know, ITIL processes that you'd expect are there and out of the box for you. But as well as those capabilities, if I just go back to the search bar at the top, let's have a look for uh, an existing ticket on here. We'll take another example here. So another process running. Um, there's a timeline with all lots of different updates, email content that's been provided, you know, videos that are being shared. If we have a look at the, uh, the comments that have been marked against that video post, we can see here that colleagues maybe within that support function that are working in their native language can all come in and they can all collaborate and post comments on the, uh, on the video or a question that may have been asked. And I can come in working in English and say, okay, well, I want to have a look at all of this information that's been posted in Chinese, Spanish uh, or French, um, and then I might want to comment back. Um, and I could do so by... Uh, writing that in my native language and then maybe uh, hitting the translate option which will translate it back into the original language of the post or I can just uh, post it in my local language and they can use the same translate capabilities uh, when working in their local language. So what we've looked at there is really sort of getting tickets in, working tickets, looking at the manual options and some sort of element of the, the customization in terms of custom buttons. I'm just going to come back out there and have a look at some of the other options that are available to you. So. Depending on your rights and permissions, you might have access to the change calendar. You might have access <coughs> to some of the admin uh, functions that are specific to this particular app. So your teams, who are the members of the teams, adding and removing them couldn't, couldn't be more straightforward. 
um, categories, both in and out, and how those are structured. Your priorities that you're working with, um, your priority matrix, you know, your default uh, operational hours. And if you're working with SLAs, uh, what are those SLAs that you're working with? Um, and what are the underlying um, escalation triggers that you can, uh, you can work with as well? So all of that's definable in here. We can come out there and also have a look at um, sort of a, if you like, a, a touch point on, on reporting and, and export capabilities. So looking at the dashboards here, we can see that we've got the ability, or depending on my rights, to create or manage existing ones. I can also, though, customise my view by selecting or um, queries that are currently available that are not displayed on the, the dashboard at the moment, and those uh, queries will then appear in here. These are just widgets, so we can move them around as, as appropriate. Uh, and if required, we can drill down to the underlying information that underpins that particular request. So the dashboards is sort of one uh, approach to this, but uh, we also have um, some role-based um, or a trending engine that underpins that role-based dashboard. So coming back to the admin console here, this is where we can come in and actually start creating measures that we want to <coughs> we want to sort of validate over a period of time. So it could be you know you know tickets logged. Uh, per day, per week, per month, but it could also be percentage of calls resolved within X, for example, all definable measures that you can set up. But then we can start to say, okay, well, how do we want to measure these? Are we looking at these, you know, hourly, daily, weekly? Um, we can set targets against those measures as well, and we can see the the actual numbers against those uh, those targets, and the the colour codes reflect whether being above or below that uh, that target is actually a good or a bad thing. And we can also see in a sort of a spike line chart how we're performing against that target over a period of time. And creating those measures. Is nice and straightforward in terms of how we want to do that and whether we're looking at sort of you know a daily count or whether we're looking at a sum or an average of floor or a ceiling or a percentile value lots and lots of configurable options in terms of you creating the measures that you're eventually going to use uh, onto your dashboards as well as the dashboards there is also the option to come back in um, using your request list um, to actually just print or export your filtered views uh, and when you're exporting from here you might you know, export all or, or some of the information that's contained uh, within there Okay. Other options that are available to me in, the, in, the, in my particular role uh, are those as a, um, an administrator of the assets. So I can come in here and this is where we might create our asset types and the attributes that we're working with. This is where I can see where the existing assets have been used or associated against other tickets. I might drop into an example of a, <clears throat> an asset. And as you'd expect, we'll have all the sort of basic information against the asset. So it's you know a unique identifier, what type it is, who owns it. Uh, if it's uh, online, retired, etc. We might also record uh, additional information, so you know, warranty data, what was the cost, who supplied this to us, as well as having, you know, are there any relationships to other assets? Uh, how many requests and what are those requests that this asset has been associated to? All of that information is available to us. Also then the question around, you know, all that other information that might be um, available about that asset within external discovery tools. So, you know, one option is that you could try and, you know, pop, bring in those hundreds of bits of information, but the question is really, you know, do we need to do that? One of the options in, in Hornbill here is actually that you just create your own sort of custom buttons that link using that unique, unique identifier out to a third-party discovery solution, um, such as your, your Soteros or your Centennials or your SCCMs, that actually allows you to interrogate further the information about that asset within that particular third-party tool rather than duplicating that information into Hornbill when that um, you know, might be an unnecessary step to take. But that's, again, is, is entirely up to you. <coughs> Other examples might be, you know, going viewing the information relating to the service tag for that particular asset. But whilst we're in here, uh, and if I've got the appropriate rights, it might also be worth me having a look um, at what you can do in terms of, you know, form design. So in this example, um, I'm an administrator. I've got the options, uh, the, the rights to customise forms, so I can drop in here. I can look at the, the details that are already there. You know, it might be sort of cosmetic changes that you're looking to make by just dragging fields around. Uh, you might be interested in looking at the uh, properties field. You know, is this going to be visible? Is it mandatory? <clears throat> Do we want any kind of field validation regarding the input that's going to be put into those fields? That's entirely up to you. Or it may be actually you want to come in and start um, adding fields. And you know, what type of fields are they? Are they combo box? Are they slides? Is it a checklist? And creating the checklist options. All of that you can uh, create. And you can do so safe in the knowledge that any of those changes that you're making, including the, the, the custom buttons, uh, including your business processes, including your, um, your progressive capture design, um, if you're using our, our XML APIs to interact or interact or interface with third party systems, or if you're using our, uh, our web hooks to push data out, all of, that and all of those um, customizations uh, carry forward with you as we update the service that we're providing to you. 
Okay, so really that was just sort of a, a run through an overview of the of the Hornbill offering, both from the Collaborative Core um, and from the Service Manager app specifically. Um, hopefully you found that useful uh, and do please let us know if you have any questions.